Right, so um, our next speaker is Erwin Kuhlmans. Um, Erwin is a senior software developer and researcher focusing on physics simulation, reinforcement learning, and robotics. Um, he is the creator of the popular bullet physics engine, which has been the basis for lots of robotics and our works out there. Um, Erwin also has a rich and diverse industrial experience ranging from Sony, AMD, Google. Um, recently, he joined NVIDIA and will be working on the Omniverse platform. Uh, we are very thankful to have him here, and let's welcome Erwin for his talk. So um, I'm going to talk about simulation and simulation of quadruped robots, but uh, the talk will also be mentioning a lot of kind of related uh, research and technologies. So um, when I accepted this um, tutorial or workshop, I actually was working at Google, working on PyBullet and Rex and Mujoku. But since two months uh, ago, I joined NVIDIA, so kind of uh, things changed a lot uh, for my work. So maybe it feels a little bit awkward to talk about these different technologies while I also work at NVIDIA. So I try to balance the, the talk about the stuff that I did at Google and also the stuff that we are doing at NVIDIA, because I think they are very complementary and very exciting, of course. So, um, if you look at the quadruped locomotion and quadruped cells, uh, you can look at it uh, in different ways. You can look at uh, the actual uh, hardware. Like uh, you can see, um, we have been working on it for like six years. There has been the, the mini tour that we started with, which was made in Philadelphia here by Ghost Robotics. Then we have uh, more recently uh, the Nikego, which is uh, a bit more advanced platform by Unitree in China. Then there is the A1 and the, the Go AD Educational, which is a more affordable platform, which I think is very exciting for uh, research because of the affordability. Uh, I think it goes for like 15,000 or something in that range, you know, so that means that uh, a lot of labs can actually use it, which means that it can also be used for reproducibility because um, some of the other platforms like um, the Animal, which is a super cool robot, um, it might not be affordable for a lot of the research labs because it's like, uh, I don't know exactly, but like 200,000 or 250,000, which is beyond the budget for many uh, people. The other thing is actually repairability. Once you are starting learning and training with reinforcement learning, the robot will break down. And um, we had it a few times in the research. We had an intern, PhD intern doing the research and um, the robot broke down just before um, the, the experiments and had to send back to China. And it took like two or three months just because of the, yeah, all the instructions and everything at the customs. So you can see that a lot of the successful um, robot labs, they build their own robot actually. Like ETH um, with the animal built their own robot and also yeah, many more of those labs. So that's not only because um, pushing the state of the art, but also they can repair the robots when they make, uh, when they break. And you can see some cool videos by Boston Dynamics about breaking robots and how they fix them. Anyway, that's the hardware side of things. Uh, I also want to briefly um, call out uh, the purple project that we are work, have been working with. It's at Stanford University. That's kind of a course for uh, graduate students. Purple is a very nice cheap platform. It's like um, $600. Uh, I will briefly uh, mention how you can build it and how you how the Stanford course looks like for the purple. So then uh, we have si simulators at the bottom. We have uh, PyBullet I've been working on for a long time. There is a tiny differential simulator, which is more recent work. Uh, Mujoku is a very popular um, physics engine that we um, will see more of, especially since it's being open source uh, this week. Uh, RISIM is also a nice uh, physics engine by uh, Jamin Huango at, um, at the time at uh, ETH. And then there is, uh, of course, Omniverse Isaac Young with NVIDIA Physics and also a lot of more physics technologies in there. <clears throat> so just one quick slide about PyBullet. Um, I have to excuse for people who have been here on Monday. There is quite a bit of duplication in the slides, but um, maybe uh, it makes you remember more what I've been saying. Maybe. Anyway, so the bullet, bullet um, has been developed specifically for reinforcement learning. So originally, Bullet was C++, but PyBullet has been made for learning. So you can see that in the APIs. Uh, you can probably not see that in the APIs right now because the letters are too small, but uh, I can see it here. <laughs> but um, that's basically like um, you can load robot models 
from ROS like URDF and MGCF. You can um, do the training easily, making a gym, open AI gym environment for the, um, specifying the reward function and the observations, etc. There's a lot of more APIs for uh, specifically to make it easy for uh, people to get started. So I think of it myself as by bullet as a little Swiss army knife. You know, so um, some larger projects like uh, Omni Omniverse is much more serious and um, like a professional and also useful for real like industrial use cases. While um, by bullet is more like a little tool that lets you um, focus on the actual uh, learning part. Just like Isaac Jim um, is as well, actually. So um, that means that uh, the rendering is quite rudimentary. So you don't really um, can exploit vision very well. And there's a lot of other shortcomings. So I'm quite happy to actually work with a bigger team in NVIDIA to uh, complement all those uh, simulations with good rendering and good infrastructure to other tools. Um, for example, um, if you want to author the robot, I've been doing that by hand, actually. You know, you, you have a robot, you start measuring uh, the masses and the, the, the dimensions, and then we hand edit it in the URDF file, which works for me. Uh, and usually it's not a big issue because uh, we don't get new robots all the time. But um, as you want to make the environments more interesting, it's not just a robot, you also want to also the environment, you know, like uh, the, the indoor environments. And maybe there will be uh, people walking around with animation. And then you need really a rich format, like an USD, for example. So very quickly, uh, the centurial that got us started at Google. So at Google, I started a little simulation, uh, sorry, locomotion team. Like uh, at the moment, I think it's like 10 research scientists. And um, this, we had no idea about robots. So it was kind of new to us. We were mostly uh, having a computer graphics background. and reinforcement learning background kind of. So we start with a cheap robot, the mini top, you can see here the images. And uh, we also, uh, Ghost Robotics had also no experience with uh, reinforcement learning at all. So when we got that robot, we did a bit of experiments and the robot starts deforming slowly because it was made of aluminum legs. And as soon as you fall down, the deformation was permanent. So we had to send back the robot to Ghost Robotics here in Philadelphia and uh, wait for a couple of weeks and we got the robot back. And after a few times, it became clear that it was not really the way forward for us. So we iterate with uh, the manufacturer to make the um, robot more suitable for reinforcement learning, which meant like um, carbon fiber um, legs and frame so that uh, the deformation um, wasn't permanent. So in a nutshell, uh, this research was actually quite basic seen in hindsight, but uh, when you're working on it for one year, it looks like a, a, a big um, mountain to climb. So we basically got, uh, made an interface to the robot from the simulation. So simulation is running by bullet. The robot was using a Raspberry Pi, something like that. So we had a um, serial connection, which was quite slow. And then we could basically transfer our policies to the, to the Raspberry Pi. So to make it work, we did a lot of domain randomization. You can see some table here. We did it all by, by hand, you know, so choosing the upper and lower bounds to make them kind of so that it works, but uh, don't make them too big so that it doesn't become super inefficient. So that's kind of this challenge between robustness and optimality that you might face. More recently, people have been doing this more automatically, I think, in research, so you can tune those ranges more uh, easily with hyperparameters. But, um, this paper was for, I don't remember, I think, um, I forgot, the, actually, it was in January, I remember that actually, but I'm thinking which uh, conference it was actually. But uh, anyway, um, it was December and we didn't have a result, the robot could not walk, not, could not walk, so it was quite stressful at that time. And uh, finally, just uh, the end of December, we figured out that the latency, we didn't really compensate for latency. Like it's, uh, if you use a simulation like uh, Isaac, uh, Jim, or Pi Bullet or Mojoko, by default, if you get a position, you get a position right now. While in a real robot, if you get a position, the position, uh, the request for getting a position is sent over a, a slow a connection, like an Ethercat or a Canvas, or even in our case, it was a serial connection to the Raspberry Pi, which takes quite a few milliseconds. Because you send it to the Raspberry Pi, the Raspberry Pi sends it to the motor controller, that does like a magnetic encoder to get the numbers. 
it sends it back to the Raspberry Pi and that goes back uh, to the to your policy, which takes easy like 30 or 40 milliseconds. So once we sorted that out, it actually started working. The, the good thing about the MIDI tour was that it was a direct drive uh, motor, so we didn't need to model the dynamics of the motor. Whereas, for example, if you take the animal, it has much more complicated uh, dynamics. So they made a, they trained a neural network actually to do the to model the actuator dynamics using actuator net. So anyway, we got results. It was quite we were very excited once it started working. Um, you can also see the image down there where the flexible brackets to make them non-permanent. Uh, it introduced uh, another challenge for the centurion. So we wanted to simulate deformable dynamics as well for this. And um, let's see. So we also open source everything. I'm a very big fan of open source. So um, all the work that we have been doing in Google and also I hope some of the work in NVIDIA will be open source, not all of it, but quite a bit. And um, so you can see here, um, one, one of the things, if you look at the previous uh, video, um, the motion is very chaotic. And we wanted to have more like controllable motion. So one of the ideas was to put a rubber ducky uh, on the mode, on the robot. So the idea was that um, as soon as the ducky falls on the ground, we basically terminate the episode. So it's kind of like a way to reward shaping through the termination function. And um, David Ha has been doing uh, some research by, back then in, in 2017 using CMAES. And um, it's quite exciting actually because uh, um, also funny because uh, you can see that reinforcement learning tries to exploit um, the, the possibilities. So you, I don't know if it actually, um, It's supposed to show that uh, ball rolling into the concavity of the robot, if you look there. So it could actually um, work with the ball on the surface, but then the, it, 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 it triggers the robot so that the ball actually landed up in the concavity and then it could run very fast, chaotic. So there's kind of really funny things that uh, turns out if you do reinforcement learning with robotics. The other problem with uh, what that we faced was uh, the reset in the real world. I think if you use robots, that will be also happening. Uh, we, we built all kind of constructions like um, you can see on the right side and also the robots one of the next iterations it could actually reset by itself and we also have some research that um, explicitly tries to reset a robot afterwards this is kind of a robot that can walk upside down as well so it's quite cool so it falls on its back and then it just walks continuous walking on its back it's kind of a very nice uh, feature I like the mention by the previous speaker from Facebook about um, safety, which is very important. We also have a, a group work on robot safety, and uh, we actually also enco encountered it ourselves. I had an intern, Jason Peng, doing um, research with the robots, with the like go in this case. And then um, you, you see this, um, this construction that keeps up the robot. He was using an electro elect electric version of that with some and then one of the pieces flew into his face on his nose. So he got a bleeding nose. But then we realized if it would have hit his eye, he might have lost his eyesight. So we, from then on, we had to um, wear goggles, safety goggles. Um, as I said, we didn't have a proper uh, robotics background. So from then on, uh, we actually had a group that uh, looked into all those things, including uh, the battery, you know, like lithium battery um, has the possibility to catch fire. And the, the building that we were in Google was wooden building. So if it would have catch fire, the whole building would have been gone probably. So we learned how to deal with uh, lithium batteries, etc. So safety is a big issue. Uh, another quick mention about uh, policy, a PMTG, policy modulating trajectory generators. It's pretty actually that, um, is there a way to modify, move this away? This, um, Green arrow. It's, it's almost impossible to do reverse. Uh, this is on the back of the screen, I guess. Green arrow. Okay, that's that. So for this uh, previous work, we actually did directly applied uh, torque control and position control using PID. But um, often you can get more interesting and easier to learn policies by changing the action space. So we have this policy modulating trajectory where we have a trajectory generator. 
I think even um, in biology, like uh, cats and also people, we have some kind of built-in trajectory generator apparently that uh, makes you like move in repetitive uh, motions. So we added this as well for the um, for the robots. We got some good results, more predictable results. Because without that, uh, the motion can be very chaotic. Then uh, Jason Peng has been working in our lab for a year doing this um, deep mimic for robots, for imitating animals. That was quite exciting work. So for that, we did motion capture on a, on a dog, and then we got uh, motion capture data, and then we wanted to have a real robot following this motion capture data. And uh, you can see uh, the, the, the workflow that we, we took for motion capture on the, on the real dog, which was quite tricky on its own because uh, the dog wants to run away all the time and we wanted to walk on a treadmill. That was kind of interesting. Then um, we needed to do inverse kinematics to map the motion of the dog onto the degrees of freedom and the physiology of the robot. And then we have this uh, reference motion that we generate, which is like a data set, by the way. So I, I looked into the purpose of this uh, of today, and one of the questions was about data sets. So we, we do actually share um, all the data that we made for this um, imitating animals as well. And then um, once we have this um, motion imitation data, we can actually try to train a policy to mimic the data, but also not fall over. So we need to balance the imitation. And after that, in simulation, we need to move on the real world. So this training took like one or two days. And I want to mention that because uh, and you, uh, Jason Peng was interned originally for three months. If you have two days training, that's quite significant. And that reduces your amount of experiments a lot. So I think with tools like um, Isaac Jim, uh, reducing this to 10 minutes or 15 minutes is much more exciting for uh, interns and also for, uh, for full-time uh, researchers. So this is all open source as well. So you can check it out. Uh, there was a Git repo, that's a Google research motion imitation. There was a fork called paper, that's the original data. And then uh, we have been using this repository uh, for follow-up research. So we added a model predictive control because um, a lot of times uh, you can throw reinforcement learning at a problem, but uh, you might actually have a good solution uh, with traditional control, you know, optimal control or model predictive control. So we implemented that. We actually took it from the MIT Mini Cheetah. They have a nice um, paper on this, this convex MPC. We also implemented, implemented this for the A1 robot. So you see here the, the simulation and also the actual robots doing the same uh, policy. I mean, the A1 robot, of course, comes with the built-in gates, but we wanted to make it so that we could control them for our own purposes so we can do more interesting work. Um, that's one of the nice things about um, open source. You want to indeed have uh, benchmarks and um, setups that can be reused by other people. So we had a nice surprise by um, Baidu team in China. They used our uh, repository to train the A1 to climb the stairs. So I put a link here. They also made their work open source. And um, yeah, as I said, I wanted to briefly mention the DGI purple. That's what we have been doing the last year with Stanford University. There's a link um, that um, goes over all the steps for students and, and graduates to, to build a robot and also to actually train the robot. Which is, um, I think the cost is like $600, but you also need a bit of handiness to, to build a robot. I think they are going to work with some company to let you order the robot for like less than $1,000. But of course, this robot is, um, is not as, as nice as the A1. So I think if you can afford it, you probably want to have an A1 robot. So now quick, quickly uh, something about future directions, because I think that's more, more exciting, because I think the stuff that I mentioned so far is, um, is already quite well known. And um, we want to do new stuff right, as researchers. So, on one side is the, the direction of much faster simulations that has a lot of potential. Not only that you can train much faster, but you can also use the simulation for, um, for the intelligence on the robot in the future, I think. Like if, if people um, move to the environment, we can basically um, reconstruct what's happening around you. 
And uh, if you can have a very fast simulation, you can do very fast hollows as well in parallel. So you can basically build a model of the world around you, and then you can do forward hollows to see like what would happen if this is uh, going to happen. So I think that's why fast simulations is also very important. The other direction is the differential simulation. I will briefly mention that. And as, and as I said, like trying to build a model from, from vision. And, and once you do that, you need very fast vision as well. So our omniverse, uh, Isaac Jim, also needs very fast perception with RGB cameras. So I don't need to talk much about this because uh, Lila already mentioned everything very nice in her uh, previous presentation today. I do want to briefly call out another project that is part of um, Omniverse, which is called WARP. So, um, and the other part that I want to mention is uh, the reinforcement learning itself. So, um, Isaac Jim and also I think the upcoming Isaac, Om Omni Isaac Jim, has a uh, very fast accelerated PPU and SAC. So, it keeps everything on the GPU, which is also essential to keep things fast. And um, that means that. Um, you can actually use different simulators with that. It's also open source, actually, for our games. So you can use Isaac Jim or Brex or Mujoku or maybe Bullet, even though maybe not so efficient, but you can use arbitrary physics, physics engines for that. And I show you some, some of the things that Elida already showed you as well. So the neural sim is um, something that I care about a lot. And I did some research with Eric Heide on this. So the idea is the following. So if you look at uh, NVIDIA physics and also PyBullet and Mojoku, they are kind of old style physics, traditional physics engines. So they do their job very well, but I think they are not really um, the end point, the end game, you know, because um, for a couple of reasons, I think. Some of them is uh, that it's kind of hard to model things, especially when it's not exactly fitting in the physics engine. Like uh, for example, this Minitor had flexible brackets of course, you can add explicit uh, deformal models to find it to use finite element, met finite element method to model those flexible brackets. But there will be more and more kind of more complicated um, bits in a simulation. And instead of modeling it explicitly, I think the nice thing about neural sim that you can use data to make your simulator better. So that, there's a couple of different options for that. You see the analytical model, that is what uh, Mojoku and PyGold and NVIDIA physics does right now today. You can do a fully data-driven model where you have a black box neural network that you train from data, and then uh, you hope that everything works, but you have no idea how it works. Then there is the residual physics, where we basically have a traditional physics engine, and we run a neural network next to it, and then try to augment and push it a bit towards the, um, closing the reality gap. And the last one, that's the hybrid simulation that we have been working on. That is kind of like a physics engine, like uh, Mojoku and physics and Bullet. But uh, anywhere in the, in, the, um, in the implementation, you can actually replace the, um, the bits with neural networks. So that is kind of a very exciting direction, I think. Um, and you can make it very modular as well. So you can actually train, you can actually also train like where in the physics engine do we need neural networks? So you can, we call this neural network scalars and neural networks uh, components. We just touched the surface on this, but I think it's an exciting direction. There's also some uh, links for people if you, if you want to see the, the paper. Another thing uh, is uh, Brex. I worked on it just before leaving Google. I think Brex is also kind of nice in the sense that uh, it shows the benefit of uh, fast simulation. Uh, there's a cool app. I think that's also a good, um, uh, a, a good way uh, of um, exposing your software to people. Like CoLab is like an online um, website. That lets you do the training right in the browser. So you don't need to set up your environment uh, locally. And I think also uh, NVIDIA Omniverse is going to have such, such a similar uh, features in the future, I expect, where you can basically uh, run simulations in the cloud and you get a front end and you don't need to set up your computer locally all the time. Then there is uh, how many minutes do we have? Or am I already over time? Yeah, I will wrap up here. Sorry about that, but I, I will wrap it up soon. Promised. So there is a warp inside Omniverse. Warp is um, similar to JAX in some way. It basically lets you write Python code, but then um, you jet compile it to something super fast. So you can compile it uh, towards CUDA code. 
That means you can just write reward functions or observation functions, but also you can actually write entire simulations in, in RAR. Not going over this, but um, you get some super exciting results. And also, RAR is uh, differentiable. So we can also use RAR for this research in kind of hybrid physics engines where we have kind of a traditional pipeline, but also some bit data driven models. So RAR also has already components from, uh, from actual physics engines like OpenVDB or Nano, Nano VDB. And we might even get uh, neural networks in there um, in the future for this kind of thing. And just one more minute to wrap up. Um, so more recently with uh, Eric Heide, we have been working on video to sim. The working title was actually pixels to URDF. So we basically as input, we have um, RGB images or RGB video. Then we use uh, the Facebook uh, detectron to detect the objects, like where the objects are approximately and where the joints, where we expect some joints. Then we have a render engine, a differential renderer from NVIDIA, the NVDIFREST, and we have the differential simulator from, um, from the previous project, the tiny differential simulator. Um, having everything differentiable means when we can backpropagate from the, from the pixels all the way back to the reward function. And that lets us actually reconstruct the URDF file from that contraption. So we have some results in simulation and we also have some simple results in the real world. Very simple, so it's kind of not very general purpose yet, but we might use things like nerves to make it more general purpose. Thank you very much. Okay.